um, in the 2010 census, New Jersey lost a congressional district because people did not return the census forms. And when it was time to apportion seats, New Jersey showed up um, lacking. And so that apportionment went to another state. And we stand the risk if people do not respond to the census again this time of losing another congressional seat. And that's important in terms of who's in Washington voting for resources to come back to our um, communities. Housing, whether or not housing gets built, whether or not there's funding for housing, um, rental assistance determined by the census. Transportation, whether or not you get a bus line, whether or not there's a train that stops in your, your community or in your neighborhood, determined again by the census. Everything that affects um, things in schools, lunch programs, how many books you have, whether or not you have resources for technology, determined by the 600 odd billion dollars that's distributed every year by the census. So that's why they have to be involved. They have to be engaged. And this is certainly um, a step that um, a lot of other schools aren't taking to talk about how important the census is to their students. So I, like I said, I, I take my hat off to, to, to the folks at uh, Bloomfield College for making sure that your students are keenly, keenly aware of how they can impact the census. It's one of the most important decisions that they're going to make. Yes, there's an election coming up in November. And for your students, it will be one of the most important elections in their lifetime. And for people in my generation, it is the most important election in our lifetime. The census determines how the electoral college votes are um, delegates are determined. And we've seen situations not too long ago where, you know, you can win the popular vote, but lose the electoral college vote. And ergo, you're the, pre the president of the United States. So it's important that they understand that their future is going to be determined by the outcome for 10 years of this 2020 census. Uh, you must be on mute. I can't, I can't hear you. Mr. Bankson, I can't hear you. Sorry about that. Sure. We, um, I was saying before we transition to or go to more questions and we'll also open up the webinar to let the audience engage as well. Um, mm -hmm. But you have some resources that you have shared with us. Uh, would you kind of like to go through that presentation first? Sure. If you could uh, put those up that I've, that I've sent. Um, I've sent a number of um, graphics that I think highlight and underscore the importance of the census and gives a real good description of, first of all, what the questionnaire looks like, because it's very, very easy. Um, you heard it took less than 15 minutes to complete it online. So do you want to start running those and I can speak to them as you put them up? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So these links are also, I put into all the resources into one Google Drive and that link is also available via the chat. However, I am going to share my screen now, which will allow you to also view um, the same documents uh, while looking at your screen. And while we're waiting for the, those screens to come up, um, I think that it would be important for um, your students to know a little bit about the um, slightly nefarious history of the census. Um, we've been doing the census in this country, and it's mandated by the Constitution since 1790. And that first census that came out um, really showed kind of the, the thinking, if, if you will. Um, the only people that counted in that census were free white males, free white females. Um, and then the other category was all other free people. I don't quite know who that was and slaves. And there was a big fight about how and whether or not slaves should be counted. Um, some people wanted the information on how many slaves there were in the southern states to be counted because simply 
that made greater representation for them. And others thought that, um, and this is documented in, 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 in books, I'm not making it up because it is so awful that you would think it's made up, that um, black people were a completely different species and therefore did not fit. And these were allegedly well-meaning people did not fit into and should not be uh, counted because it wasn't that they were a species and the constitution was clear that persons were supposed to be counted. Um, they, um, and as it, as it went on, it changed and uh, it got uh, more reasonable, but there was a point in time when um, the information about where black people lived was used to do things like uh, boost eugenics, the notion of inherent black inferiority. It was used to enforce or fuel the uh, Tuskegee experiment where cure for syphilis had been found, but they wanted to see how it affected um, black people. And of course, they knew from the census where we were in um, at Tuskegee. And so there's been a history of um, concern about how the census data would be used with respect to people um, who were people of color. And, um, I think that bit of history is important because it, it, it highlights and underscores the importance, um, of being counted and having our voices raised and heard of standing up. But I'm looking at your, your slide where you're showing the amount of money in New Jersey. Look at that. Look at that number. You know, that's, and a tremendous amount of money that New Jersey gets as a result of the census. And imagine how much more it could have been for all of the things that are listed on the slides that you, on the deck that you're showing and that you're going to distribute to your students if everybody had just responded to the census. Um, you look and you, you're going to share it with everybody. You'll go down through it. You'll see how the money is being used. Um, the census dollars is another slide which shows all of the programs and all of the initiatives that touch every aspect of our lives that are driven by the census count that takes place every 10 years as mandated by the constitution. Um, every, there, there's no, there's nothing that, that you do, nothing that you are engaged in, um, Almost no aspiration is not, is, is not included in the census. If you're interested in, in the performing arts, if you're interested in science, all of the kinds of things that you're interested in are funded in some way, shape, form, or fashion by the response of the census or response or lack thereof to the census. I included some, um, some charts and, and data on what's called the hard to count areas. And that's a term of art that comes from the census. It's a reflection from the Census Bureau. It's a reflection of the number and the places where people did not respond. And the, I, I particularly targeted, um, uh, uh, legislative districts 28, 29, and 34 and 28. Um, is where Bloomfield is, uh, where the college is located. And to the extent, and you'll see those, those numbers in greater detail when you take a look at them, um, where people did not respond and where there was an undercount. That constitutes a hard to count area. And then it really gets shocking when you look at legislative district 29, which includes Newark and Belleville, where the hard to count number is extraordinary. Look at the number of people that did not respond in 2010, whose communities are now being adversely affected, who need to hear the call to action to come out and respond in 2020. That's also true of the hard to count area 34, where you see tremendous people Tremendous numbers of people in East and East Orange and Irvington did not respond. And then contrast that with hard, with the hard to count number for legislative district number 25, which includes areas where people responded in huge numbers. And I do a lot of presentations, um, on, on the census and the importance of the census because I'm called to do it. I believe in it. And I know the impact, especially having been a mayor 
and seen, you know, whether or not we get money for certain programs and projects that are important to our community. And I hear from people that, well, you know, other people get more than we do and they cite all kinds of reasons, but those aren't the real reasons. It's you didn't send the census back. So that's why you don't have technology in your classrooms. That's why you don't have a bus line or a train line. That's why companies won't come to your area that could be potential employers, because if they don't believe you're there or if they don't know that you're there, guess what? They're not going to come. And I urge, I urge your students and everybody else that's joined in to take a look at this, at this data to see how dreadfully we're impacted when people don't respond. Like I said, for every person that doesn't respond, that's $2,000 a year for each year, 10 years. So you've cost your community, you alone have cost your community $20,000. And that's not a small number when you multiply it by the number of people that just did not see fit to respond. And for the first time since we've been doing the census, since 1790, you're able to respond online. And that is a very easy um, easy thing to do. It's a, a, a simple questionnaire. You go right online, you, you click on the link and you start answering the questions. And between 10 and 15 minutes, guess what? You're done, they acknowledge receipt. And I know that you know, one of the challenges has been that some people might not have access to technology, but you can certainly, once you get your letter, you can certainly do it on the phone. Um, you can send it in via mail. But the easiest way to do it, particularly now that so many things are, are, are shut down as we deal with the, um, the, the pandemic crisis, is to do it online. And unfortunately, because most of our public libraries are closed and there was such tremendous cooperation from the libraries in our area who were setting aside computers and uh, spaces in their in their um, libraries for people who did not have or do not have access to to the technology um, they were setting that aside so people could come in but just about so many people have a phone if you've got a smartphone you can do it on your phone but as I said you can also call in and uh, answer the questions uh, it's a little bit uh, daunting to do that now because so many places that you would be calling in are shuttered as a result of uh, the, the sheltering in place and the need to do social distancing. Um, but it's not impossible. And uh, most of you, you know, the, nobody's better at technology than, than our, our students and they can help each other and help others as well. Thank you, Dr. Harley. Um, I guess one of the things is students can take action by doing what? What do we want them? What should they do? And why is it important to the April 1st date, even though it's April 2nd today? Yeah, the April 1st date, let me let me stay on that for a quick second. It's kind of an arbitrary date. You have to have a date when you ask people to send or to respond or to mail in or to call. Um, so the April 1st date was called April, it was called Census Day, and traditionally it's been uh, Census Day. Um, many years ago, it was sometime in August that was considered Census Day. So you have to pick a date when people, when you ask people to respond. Uh, we know now that the Census Bureau has elongated the timeline. They've stretched it a little bit because of what's going on in terms of the, again, the sheltering in place, the COVID-19. Um, and I'll just go over the timeline that was originally set, um, that they wanted everybody to respond by April 1st. Uh, and there are constant reminders, constant notices going out. People are getting things in the mail, asking them to please respond, please respond. So that's going to go on for a while. They were hoping that they would have everybody's um, uh, information in by no later than the end of April. We know that that timeline has been extended. There is a, uh, a plan to, from April 29th through May 1st, over those three days, to go out and have census workers uh, go out and look for people who um, don't, are, 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 you know, friends without addresses, 
the homeless folks. They're going to shelters. They were going to go to soup kitchens. They were going to um, non-sheltered um, uh, places such as under bridges, in parks, those kinds of things, and those locations to do the count. That is being um, changed a little bit. The operation's being changed a little bit because of the circumstances that we're in. From April 16th through June 16th, they were going to reach out to colleges, senior centers, other places that house people, um, military bases, and, and re-emphasize the count there. That too may be changed, um, changed a little bit because of the uh, timeline. And then they were going to, uh, from May 27th through August 14th, go again to households that didn't respond through uh, sending out enumerators and, and census takers. This is a timeline that is being moved along, but it shows you in tranches and in groups how a complete count was originally envisioned to uh, make sure that it would occur. And students can be very involved. Um, post on social media. Let your friends know, and these are all student leaders, you know, let your friends know um, that um, the count is important. Share the information about how it impacts you, friends and family, uh, people that you know in your student groups and organizations. Even though you can't gather now as, as a group because we do have the social distancing going on, but just like we're on Zoom, they can be on Zoom to carry this information and the documents that you have and talk to each other and become ambassadors, in essence, for the census and let people know that this affects you in all the ways we've described, and particularly students, in terms of funding for Bloomfield College. For all the reasons that Bloomfield College is unique, um, it's why the census is important for them to engage in. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the numbers because you mentioned to that. So we recently got some data that said 33,000 of uh, students represent Exus County and yet oh, 35,000. And then I think there's a 35, 33% um, return rate in terms of completing the survey. We have uh, a resident population, as you know, at Bloomfield College. Majority or a significant number of our resident students come from the state of New Jersey. Um, they also come from places like Patterson, Trenton, Newark, Newark, which is the largest city in the state, 13 percent. How can we do better? How can we motivate students to get off of this live, go to the census um, uh, um, link, complete the information? How can we be sure that they uh, complete it completely? Because one of the points that you made on our call yesterday is that we want students to document where they would be as of April 1st if we were not dealing with the coronavirus. Could you explain and clarify some of those points? Yes, I'm happy. I'm happy to do that. Um, for college students, they are counted where on April 1st they live or sleep even if they live in a dorm and even if they're displaced right now by the coronavirus. So if you would have been in your dorm and on your campus on April 1st, living and sleeping, that is where you count. You're counted. And the census has something called group quarter on a group quarter operation. And each group quarter um, has a, an administrator. So there's some, It does that time, someone, time, sorry. Yeah, from time to time. Um, I, I thought it was one of those, um, you know, how you get hacked on Zoom. So I got a nervous when I saw it because we, we had another situation in another Zoom where some outsiders got in. But so if they, whoever is your group order administration administrator will be contacted by the census because they were supposed to come out and um, they were supposed to come out and meet and do the count on your campus. But of course, that is no longer um, in play. So the Census Bureau's representative who was assigned to Bloomfield College will reach out to your administrator, whoever's the designated administrator, and go through the steps they're going to take to make sure that every student who is resident at Bloomfield College gets counted. If you have students who commute and were living at home, they will use their home address. Their form will go to them at home. Um, and if they had students who were living off campus 
in their own uh, quarters, they will get their form. But for the students that live on campus, which is a very important population to make sure that that count is accurate, the administrator will, from the census, will reach out to your administrators at Bloomfield College to make sure that every single student is counted. And they're working on the details of how to do that in the face of, um, you know, the coronavirus. So for parents um, or homes who got the form in the mail, like my home, we got the form in the mail. I opted to go online and complete it. Is there any sort of conflict of interest that can occur by students maybe going online um, while their parents may have the form and didn't consult with them? Um, should students be encouraged to speak to their parents about this and say, hey, I'm a resident student. I should use this address, uh, mom or dad. Uh, what's your advice in that area? Yeah, my, my advice to the students is that let your parents know that you're going to be counted on your campus, even if you are home now, but you were a resident student. And it's important because if they live elsewhere, Bloomfield and Bloomfield College doesn't get the resources allocated and won't get the resources allocated to them. And that's why they particularly like for students who are resident and would have been on campus as of April 1st to make sure that they are counted at their college. Dr. Evans, anything you want to add to that point? No, 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 I totally agree. Um, again, we need to get them counted at the, the college addresses that they have. Because again, it impacts the resources that we can get as I was talking from Pell Grants to other types of funding, whether it's TAG or EOF within the state and above and beyond. Um, so please, please uh, make sure that you go ahead, number one, and do the census. I don't care what address you use, but if you can, again, use the college's address to help with the resources and to kind of pay it forward too as well, uh, I would definitely encourage the students to be able to do that. And I, I think, too, uh, that looking at the age of, you know, uh, you want to talk about that, Dr. Harley, and you don't have to be working and making sure everybody in your household is counted. The babies, everybody. Absolutely. Every, the, the, the purpose of the census is to count every single person. And so it doesn't matter what how old or young they are. If they're in your household and the question will ask you, the, the questionnaire will ask you over and over again, person number one, usually the head of household, who else lives in your house? And they want the data on every single person in your household. And it, it's it's important because, you know, a lot of people were concerned that this would be a ruse to um, um, identify those who are undocumented and do something through them through immigration. And I can tell you that I've been, like I said, been involved in doing census work as a, a volunteer, um, as, as a mayor for many, many years. I've seen a number of censuses come and go. And there has never been a case where someone had an um, unfortunate incident occur or happen to them, either an arrest or either um, uh, 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 being deported. Due to census data, there are tremendous fines for breaking the confidentiality of the census. And I understand why people have some trepidation about this because of everything else that's going on. But I urge people, do not let fear silence your voice and getting resources to your community or resources to your family and resources to the places that you believe in and want to have resources allocated to. Please don't let that um, let that happen. I'm going to um, ask any of the audience members, whether they're on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, but definitely those that are in the chat and we will make BC students a priority um, and our staff and faculty as well in that order uh, to um, just click the raise your hand um, icon if you have a question and I will make you live and you'll be able to, we won't see you, but we'll hear you. You'll be able to state your name, uh, where you're from if you want, and ask any questions. So just prepare yourself for that. If you have questions, raising your hand now or just mentioning that in the chat will give me an indication, and then I will come to you in that order. In the meantime, uh, Dr. Harley, um, there also are there still employment and volunteer opportunities considering all that's going on, and how can our students be connected to that? Because we know they need some money. Yes. Right? The uh, census uh, is recognized. The Census Bureau recognizes that they do have to hire enumerators, 
And the process had started. A number of people had been offered positions uh, to go out and start the actual enumeration process, which is a door-to-door following up on those households that don't or have not responded in a timely enough fashion. That is on hold right now simply because you can't have people going out door to door if you're asking people to shelter in place. But the opportunities do exist. And um, as we see other businesses closing and the unemployment rate just skyrocketing nationwide, the census is a place where you can turn to. And I'd urge anybody that's interested in working, particularly since we in this These districts that I've given you, 28, 29, and 34, have had a tremendous undercount in the past. Um, That's where they're looking to hire people. And if you are ready, willing, and able, there are opportunities to to work. So go to census.gov backslash jobs and apply and get yourself in the queue because a number of people have dropped off. Um, But it's, uh, it's, 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 uh, available to, to, and they particularly do like students because students have a certain um, um, ability to engage people and they have the, um, the, the moxie, if you will, to talk about how important this is and why it's important and why their future and the future of the people, their, the children of the future they're speaking to and recruiting to complete the census, why that is all tied together. So they, uh, the census really does like hiring students um, to go out and be, again, ambassadors as well as enumerators. And the pay, as I understand it from um, yesterday, the pay jumped from $21 an hour to $24 an hour because it's so crucial and so, so critical. Okay, I want to uh, transition to some of the questions that we have uh, from sure. students. We also have one of our student leaders. So I'm going to ask Narita to come in and kind of explain how CSLE um, the Center for Student Leadership and Engagement at Bloomfield College plans. Uh, we have incentives to empower and inspire our, our student leaders to be ambassadors. As you said, Dr. Harley, I thank you for mentioning that because it's important that even in this time, um, we have to step up and step into our leadership roles and help out. Um, we can't allow with Corona to defeat us all around. Um, it already already has us in prison in our homes um, and, and, and that is obviously safer. However, we cannot allow another 10 years to go by and we have more resources being drained by our community because we are not properly counted. And so, um, Norita, would you like to mention, uh, start off with some of the things that we can expect coming up and then also um, we can, uh, I'll open up the uh, floor for uh, Kay, who is the treasurer and secretary for our Bloomfield College Student Government. She's posed the question first and then we'll take other questions as well. Sure, yeah. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about some CSLE initiatives that we have set. Uh, So for the students, definitely look out for an email. We're going to send out uh, details about some challenges that we have for you guys. So CSLE, we want to challenge students to complete the census. So we came up with two, um, I guess just two challenges to try to get more students involved when it comes to the census and to really understand the importance of the census as well as actually filling the form out. So we came up with an individual challenge where a student could fill out the form for the census and ultimately send CSLE a screenshot or a copy of the confirmation. Uh, And then those students will be entered into a raffle. And then we're also coming up with an active group or org or club challenge where we are going to challenge the student leaders in those clubs and orgs to really try their best to promote the census, recruit students to complete the census beyond their members. We try to also just get all students. Uh, and that would be a challenge where their, their group will also be put into uh, a raffle, which is another incentive to potentially win some prizes. So, you know, we want to go beyond the idea of, you know, a raffle is definitely an incentive. We want them to understand the bigger picture of how this is really important and how this could really impact either your communities or communities nearby you when it comes to resources, funding, political representation, and, you know, just ultimately understand the benefits of it. So we're coming out with this individual student challenge, group student challenge uh, to really try to get students 
to motivate and mobilize and recruit other students to complete the census. And, you know, once they send us a confirmation, we'll put them into a raffle and they can get potentially some prizes as an active group or just as an individual um, themselves. You know, this is a way to uh, not only just promote for the census, but also a way to promote and recruit uh, supporters for the group and for the club and org that they have on campus. Uh, and ultimately to understand that this is a way that we're going to spread awareness, uh, spread the word about the census, and ultimately utilize their voice to be heard. Uh, and once again, we will send out more details through email to get more students involved in these challenges. Thank you, Narita. Before Kay speaks, um, Dr. Evans does have um, an important meeting she has to get to, of course, she has to run out college. Uh, um, would you like to say anything before we go to uh, Kay with her question? Oh, most definitely. Again, I want to express my appreciation to uh, Dr. Harley for coming in and working with our students on this very important initiative. And to you as well, Dr. Uh, <laughs> Director Bangston, uh, for taking the lead on this and you and your office and Dean Mitchell being a part of it and all the other faculty and staff that are engaged. Uh, this is extremely, extremely important. Uh, you know, I'm here behind you 100 percent. I have a board meeting in the morning and I have to talk to my board chair at three. That's the only reason why I'm, I'm uh, going to fade off for a while. It might be a quick meeting or it might be a long meeting. So uh, if I can, I'll come back in depending on how long that lasts. But you're in more than capable hands with Dr. Harley. Well, thank you so much. And once again, thank you for having the foresight to have the initiative at Bloomfield College to make sure your students are fully aware. Thank you. Okay, we're going to uh, bring Kay on and she's going to, Kay represents the Bloomfield College student government. And so I'm going to ask Kay to um, to uh, ask a question. Hi. Hi, Kay. Uh, the question that I have was that in regards, which I think you may have brushed up on it already, is that when it comes to getting young adults like myself involved, when it comes to the sentences asking, asking questions, or at least be concerned enough to be interested and want to learn more about it. I was wondering how, what ideas would you go about it to get them at least to hear people out rather than to just dismiss it? Yeah, I, I um, thank you so much for the question and thank you for your, your interest. Um, I think when you, um, and I found this to be true when I was, when I go out and do presentations, uh, when you monetize the census, let them know that for every person that doesn't fill out the census, that's $2,000 walking out of your community, walking out of the door, walking out of your schools, walking out of your hospitals. Uh, once people realize that, that it's $2,000 per person every year for 10 years, it kind of gets their attention. Let them know that if they are um, uh, wanting to know more about Pell Grants and have access to financial aid, that is diminished by not responding to the census. Um, if they are concerned about an elderly relative who receives Medicare, guess what? That is determined by the census. Whether or not they are going to be able to have mass transit, whether or not you have a fire, as I said, a fire department, whether or not you're going to be able to um, have more uh, technology at your, your, your college, uh, that is determined by the census. Whether or not employers come into your area to determine that they want to open a business and hire you. That is determined by the census. They look at the demographics of every area, and this is businesses. They look at the demographics of every area before they open up shop and come in and offer career opportunities. That too is determined by the census. Um, I love the idea that your, your, um, your administrators are creating uh, excitement around it with a raffle and, and prizes, that's always an incentive for people to get involved and to um, to become engaged. And knowing that um, you, we stand, if people behave in 2020 the way they did in 2010, we stand to lose a congressional representative, someone who would be down there fighting for us and voting our interests that is something that they have to pay attention to. And if they're interested at all in how we elect the president of the United States of America, the Electoral College 
the allocation and the setup of the electoral college is determined by the census. So um, your your campus is spot on in trying to create excitement around and give give um, uh, uh, incentives to be involved. And you, as a leader, I mean, I'm assu- I'm assuming you're elected as the treasurer. Yes. Okay. So you clearly have a base. You have people who vote for you. So your voice is going to be important because they elected you, they believe in you, and they're ready to follow you. So as you go, so will they. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kay. Um, We also have, uh, Narita has um, questions from students, but she has a question herself. So before we get to Narita, circle back to Narita, because then we want to throw in another uh, student-based question. We have our interim director of, I'm going to probably get the office wrong, so I will let her say it. But Lisa, would would you like to to say something? Because I know the employment and volunteer piece uh, for our students is very important to you as well. Hold on, I just have to unmute it. There she goes. Lisa? Lisa? Okay, I'm not sure if she's on standby. We'll go to Norita next and then circle back. Norita, your question, please. Hello. I just have a question. You touched upon this a little bit earlier about the homeless population. I work as a counselor with the homeless population that are in and out of shelters and as well as living on the streets and as well as foster care youth that are in group homes. So I'm just curious how the census plans on, you know, doing as much as possible to have those individuals counted that are, you know, combating homelessness or, you know, in the foster care system. And a lot of these young adults are aging out. And I've noticed some as well, some, some of those uh, young adults, you know, house hop because they don't have anywhere to go. So Mm -hmm. just curious in terms of those populations, what can be done and what is being done? Sure. That's a, that's a great question because um, whether or not resources are allocated for people who find themselves in a homeless situation is determined by knowing how many homeless people there are in a particular um, area. And the original plan was that from April 29th through uh, May 1st, there are a cadre of people who were hired by the census to go to homeless shelters, to go to soup kitchen, kitchens, to go into uh, non-sheltered locations like parks and bridges and places that are really, for want of a better word, outdoors, and actually enumerate point by point. They were working with the various counties and their county homeless um, staff to make sure that they counted as many of those people and ideally all of the people that find themselves in that circumstance. That is still going to happen. It's just not going to happen within the um, time frame that was originally um, scheduled due to our being sheltered in place. But there are a cadre of, of people armed with information, locations, and places, and they had reached out to all of the, the places that um, typically uh, shelter and care for homeless people and get the count there and make sure that that count is accurate. With respect to people in group homes, that goes back to the way they're going to count um, college students. They have an administrator who is working with the uh, person from the Census Bureau who's assigned to them to make sure that the students or the people in the group homes um, get counted and they'll be counted in that location where the group home um, is. For those students who are um, aging out of um, foster care um, and who are, as I say, you know, going from place to place, if wherever they are on April 1st, that household will count them. So they will be counted. Uh, Like I said, we have to be a little bit patient because we have been, um, you know, hit with a pandemic, which has slowed down the, the opportunity to execute on those plans for uh, homelessness and for people living in shelters and in non-sheltered locations. But that is going to happen. It's a a real recognition that um, some of those people were missed in 2010 and a firm commitment not to have that happen again. Thank you so much. You're welcome. 
Norita, do you want to present another question from students? And then I'm going to ask uh, one of our community partners, Parents Engaging Parents, which is a statewide parent organizing agency. And we know how important it is for everyone to be empowered in terms of um, not just our students, but we, this is a everybody affair. This is a community affair, we like to call it. So we thank Parents Engaging Parents for wanting to be a part of this. And we'll also uh, take some questions from them. Norita, any uh, one or two questions from students? Yes. Um, my next question is, you know, after the census is completed and we have numbers and applications are in and numbers are analyzed, uh, what are the next steps for college students? Like, what can they do to still be involved, to still be an advocate, to still be, you know, a community leader after the census is complete and numbers are analyzed? Like, what are some steps that you would suggest to college students they could do after the census is done because it comes every two years? Yeah, um, I, once students uh, get engaged and really understand all the tentacles that the census has, every aspect of their lives and aspects of the lives of the communities they want to serve as leaders, once they recognize and see that the census touches everything, number one, I think it's important to reach out to those those areas that you care about and are concerned about and volunteer to serve those areas. If the homeless population is a population that you want to do something about. Volunteer to work at some of those shelters and those soup kitchens. Do drives to help them thrive better and um, uh, increase their ability to serve. If if seniors are a group of people that you're concerned about, and you now know how many dollar how much. Um, the census impacts dollars that are allocated to them, find a senior uh, center, volunteer to, to work there to help. That's true of hospitals, that's true of schools, that's true of libraries, because libraries, which have been big partners um, with the Census Bureau to make sure that people have access to the technology to complete the census, are shuttered now. But libraries are underfunded in every single community. Get involved. Get on the library board. Do drives. Help them out. So wherever you see the census touches that you care about, make sure that you bring not just your um, interest in having a complete count, but make sure that you now go out and volunteer to help those organizations and also, again, become an ambassador for them in your town, libraries fight every year for their budget. Senior services fight every year for their budget. And who better than you are more knowledgeable to be able to go out and say, well, I know the census does this, that, or something else for this organization. You mayor, you council person, you commissioner need to stand up and step up for this organization as well. So it just begins with the sense and the knowledge of what the census impacts. But just as importantly, once the census is counted, guess what happens? The election. And it's going to be important for students to be registered to vote, go out and register people to vote, let people know that you know that the census determines how many people and who's going to be involved in the electoral college, going to determine how many people and who's going to, how many districts we're going to have um, for Congress. Go out and ramp up, speak up, get people to rise up and speak out about the importance of voting in this um, in this election. Like I said, for your students, this is one of the most important elections of their lifetime. But for my generation, it is not just one of, it is the most important election for our lifetime. So the doors of opportunity are going to be open for your students to volunteer and they're building a portfolio when they're volunteering for those areas and those programs and those places and those projects that they care about. Because once you've shown and demonstrated your leadership skills in that arena, guess what? Employers are going to be interested in you as well. So I urge you to please, you know, take this as a as just the beginning of your leadership development and your leadership skills that you have honed at Bloomfield College because your college was um, forward thinking and progressive enough to get you involved in the census. Thank, Thank you so you much, Dr. Norita, you have another? 
and we'll maybe yeah. do some more and then we'll do some wrap up comments if um if again anyone that's in any of the chats and i'll check on facebook now please raise your hand if you're in zoom that is not um to um uh, I don't know what term to use. That's not a petty term. It's uh, it's just a feature <laughs> to raise your hand. And uh, it's not to be disrespectful, I should say. To raise your hand and we will acknowledge you. And you have the option to be brought on the panel, as you've seen we did with Kay and others. Uh, or you can just simply put the question in the chat. Narita? Yes, I have a two-part question. The first part is if someone completes the form, a paper version of the form, and mails it out, is there a way for you to confirm that it was received. Yes. Um, once you mail your, uh, your your form in, you can go to, and there's a place on the, the census website where you can put in um, uh, your, I think it's the address, and you can confirm that they have received it. I don't think they ask for your name, but there's a there's a code or an ID number that you will have on your form when you you mail it in, and you can go in under that ID number, and you will be able to determine that it's been um, received. And you also know it's received if you don't get more emails, more letters, more postcards asking you to complete the census because they're very diligent about going back and circling back to households where they haven't received information uh, because before they um, started with the census a year ago they were going out confirming the households so if they don't get something from you they will circle back to you but you can go back through that id number that was on your form and you can check to make sure that your mail-in uh questionnaire has been received great um and another question is i know ideally we want everyone in the nation to fill out a census application, but through your experience, what do you think it's the realistic expectate, like a, the real, a real expected completion rate? Mm -hmm. um, in 2010, we had about a 60 to seven, 66 to 70% completion rate. And all of the things that we've described that make this one so easy, like being able to do it online, being able to do it by phone, will boost that number. So the expectation, the realistic expectation is it'll boost it by anywhere from 20 to 25%. There's still going to be people that we know are not going to uh, to send the census in, but between uh, the technology that's now been improved, the real uh, resources that were available to have people go out and become enumerators and the push that you're seeing from the folks at your college and across the nation to get the census done and to be counted, that we think will boost it to at least another uh, another twenty, another twenty percent, let's say. And we we're we're, you know, we're hoping for even better results, and we'll be able to tell you know ten years from now, well actually five years from now, because even though the census is done every ten years, there is something called a mini census that is done where they circle back. Um, every five years just to see what changes there have been, what could have been done better, what were better best practices that could have been implemented. Okay, thank you. Sure. You're on mute, Terrence. We do have one person that has raised their hand, just trying to link them in. Um, but Norita, you can uh, present a final question from the list of questions you have, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, I'm also interested in the margin of error. How is that accounted for in some submitted applications? Because sometimes put, people put false information intentionally or not intentionally. So the margin of error, how does that work with submitted forms for the census? Yeah, there, there's some statistical data that's relied on for um, the margin of error, because as you said, some people will put in, and I wouldn't call it, you know, and, and you corrected, it, it wouldn't be false data. They they make a mistake. And I'll give you a, a kind of a funny example. Um, I got a call from someone who um, told me that um, they just weren't quite sure how they would include a pet on the census form. And I said, well, why, why are you trying to put a pet on the census form? And they said, well, you told us that we were supposed to, that every living being should be counted. And I said that you know, trying to explain why it was so important to do the census, but I certainly didn't include um, 
I didn't think I was including um, a pet in my my presentation. And they said, we just weren't sure, you know, where that pet would fit because they're like family. They're a living being. They have health insurance. We buy health insurance for, for them. And I was so glad the person called me because I was able to disavow them of the notion that pets, although they are, although they are living beings, um, should be counted. So there may be some of that kind of um, margin of error. Or, for example, someone may think that a student who's on campus should be included, but the 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 re um, review that will take place is designed to kind of weed out um, those kinds of um, those kinds of errors. And that's why they, on college campuses, mm -hmm. where they have students who live on campus, they have a person assigned to you to make sure that we don't have duplication. And we know that there, we're human and people are human and there are some margins of error, but we're trying to get it as right as possible. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Harley, before we um, prepare to close out, Dean Mitchell, after this presentation and with the youth, um, the experience that you've had on campus, obviously this is uh, probably a second or third census that the college has experienced. Um, what is your hope or your charge to the Bloomfield community as it relates to census 2020? I am hoping that um, students will really take this powerful message and really understand the value and the impact of completing the census. Uh, I'm going to go back to my statement earlier. It took me either 15 minutes or less to complete it. And we know that our amazing students, our young people, we know that they are savvy when it comes to technology. We know that they have the power to influence thousands of people um, whether they do that through Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, um, yeah, the, the time that it takes students to, as an example, upload a TikTok video <laughs> is less time than it takes to just complete this census. And um, Dr. Harley, I just think that um, everything that you said in this segment was just so on point and so powerful. And I just want our students to know that they too are powerful. You're powerful with your voices. You're powerful with your actions. And our young people should really begin to start their own movement um, because they truly are our future. And so for them to complete the census, to make it count, really truly matters. And I know that our Bloomfield College students can do that. Dr. Evans, I, uh, you joined right at the appropriate time. We were um, preparing to close out, but I had asked Dean Mitchell um, with her experience um, in history here at the college and gone through maybe two or three census, uh, I think it's maybe two. Um, what would be your charge to students, your hope um, to the Bloomfield community in 2020? Really, again, just piggybacking on everything that's been said today and uh, especially, especially Dean Mitchell, your voice matters. Uh, don't just brush it aside. Just don't think this is one other thing or one paper to kind of toss away or not get online to do. This is critically important that you step up and you get it done. Uh, that, you know, you talk to your parents or your family members as well, not just our students, but, you know, a lot of our students are first generation college students realizing the overall fiscal impact that this has not only on Bloomfield, but with their whole community, their family, their resources, from elder care to working with the babies. It goes the full spectrum. And so, you know, we're talking about resources. I know we're focused on our college students, but I need our college students to know that their leaders are ready just by seeking a higher education, post-secondary education. And with that, they need to lead some of their family members. They need to make sure when they're talking to the cousins, the uncles, the, the whomever they have in their families, ask them if they've actually completed the census and help educate your family as well. And some of the things that Dr. Harley has shared with you today, why this is critically important. We can't just sit back and complain if we didn't vote, if we didn't complete the census, because, again, we can hold them accountable that once we have done our part of it, right, that we need to do, then we can say, okay, now where are the results and where are our resources? Because we've done our part. And so, um, you know, you got you, you to gotta be engaged. And that's really what I want to share. 
Anything from our community partner, PEP parents, engaging parents? Are you asking anybody specifically, Terrence? About yes, I was just double checking. Um, Dr. Harley, uh, any closing or, or final remarks, suggestions, um, any advice on how best to approach uh, parents? Sometimes when you're in your 20s, your parents will be like, get out of here with that sense of stuff. Any, any <laughs> advice that you will give us? <laughs> I think when you tell them that they have cost their community $20,000 over the next 10 years, if they don't fill out the census, I think they may pay attention. And let your parents know that everything they do is affected by the census. Their jobs, how they get to work, how they get home from work, whether or not there's going to be technology in the schools for your siblings, the census affects that, whether or not they have a fire department, whether or not they're gonna be able to, if things go wrong, collect unemployment. That is all allocated by the census. And certainly in this time of the coronavirus, look at what's happening. If 800,000 people had just completed the census in 2010, imagine what resources would now be available for doctors and nurses who were on the front line in the stockpile the resources are deplenished and are, are, are diminishing because we didn't have enough, not to mention the, the poor planning. That's a time for, I think, another discussion. But certainly if emergency medical services and emergency preparedness is driven by the census, the time we're living in right now has made it starkly clear that you need to fill out the forms because you never know what's going to happen next. Uh, just in closing, I just want to thank Bloomfield College for allowing us um, and encouraging us um, as staff, students, and faculty to, um, we're linking what goes on in our college community to what's real in our actual community back at home. And that is so important. Uh, so thank you to the leadership of uh, Bloomfield College. I want to thank the students who engaged and the staff and, and faculty. Uh, most importantly, I, I would like to thank our student leaders because you are the ambassadors, you are the champions, you are the voices of the students who have entrusted you, even those that didn't vote, even those that don't engage, even those that don't come on campus, you are still um, obligated to be their voice um, when they um, do not stand to speak for themselves. Uh, we will have two additional parts and we look forward to bringing on representatives from the state regarding the census um, to keep us updated and, and, and engaged on how we can be involved. Uh, we have um, next Thursday, uh, another live, but we are, uh, next week's topic is, um, I believe our guest next week is Councilwoman from Newark, uh, McIver. Uh, who's also a uh, LaMonica McIver, who's also an alumni of Bloomfield College. And uh, she's going to talk about why it's important to keep going during the fight. Why is it important not to give up? Why do we have to continue to live, continue? I think Dean Mitchell said on a call earlier, I'm choosing my happiness. And so um, we, uh, we hope that you can join us for that and support that. And until next time from CSLE, everyone take care. Thank you for joining. Thank you. And take care and stay safe. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Take care, everybody.